short lecture is going to talk about Henry James, especially in relation to his novella, Daisy Miller, which we're going to be reading for class. So Henry James is often referred to as the master. He is one of the United States' most influential fiction writers. He took realism to new levels, describing psychological states as intricately as other realists describe the physical world. And he really serves as an essential link between 19th century realism and 20th century modernism. So James had a life of extraordinary privilege that gave him every opportunity to develop his intellect and his talent as a writer. He was born in 1843 to a wealthy family in Manhattan. He lived in Washington Square for a time. When he was younger, he was um, about eight or nine years old when he went to Europe with his family and he received most of his education in Europe. He came back to the United States, did quite a bit of his writing here, but eventually he ended up settling in England. And in 1915, he became a British subject because he disagreed with the United States staying out of World War I. Um, so he became a British subject the year before he died after living in England for over 50 years. So many of James's novels and stories, including Daisy Miller, deal with a relationship between Americans and Europeans, a relationship that he was uniquely poised to appreciate as an American expatriate. And James, like T.S. Eliot later, is often going to be claimed by both American literature and by British literature. So we're going to talk about a few different things um, in Henry James's Daisy Miller, um, one of the most important things that you need to understand as you go into this text is the idea of the new woman. So the new woman was exactly what it says. It is a new woman. As you can see in this picture, um, at the turn of the century, so the late 19th, early 20th century, women, as we've discussed before, started wanting more equality. You have the suffrage movement, you have more women going after education. And so you have women pushing the boundaries of society. You see in these images, um, showing their legs or wearing pantaloons or in the middle image, even an older woman reading the paper and not paying attention to her husband. Um, so one of the epitomes of the new woman is the Gibson girl. In the 1890s, illustrator Charles Dana Gibson began to depict American women in a manner that became famously known as the Gibson girl, and you see her here. It's a style of white womanhood that combined femininity with virility. On the cover of popular Scribner's magazine, the subject confidently rides directly into the gaze of the viewer. Her nipped waist and perfectly posture suggest traditional feminine manners. However, she wears bloomers, pants, a garment associated with female independence and strength in the 19th century. The term new woman became increasingly popular at the turn of the century as a way to refer to women who exercised control over their personal, economic, and sexual lives. Both in Daisy Miller and the other um, reading of James that's in our textbook, The Turn of the Screw, they both feature female protagonists, both deal with the women's ambiguous relationship with their own sexuality. Daisy Miller is either free and open with her sexuality as she defies social conventions, or she's naive and completely unaware of how her relationship with men will be perceived by the world around her. So as you read through Daisy Miller, think about these women characters and their relationships to both sexuality and the world around them. Part of why James is so important is his skillful portrayal of ambiguities as a commentary on the emergence of this new type of woman at the dawn of the 20th century. Um, his representation is never super heavy handed. So one of the things you may want to consider is whether James is part of the larger androcentric culture that is fundamentally misunderstanding the women, or if he sees the women as kind of strong, capable promises for the future. So Daisy Miller was an immediate and widespread, pop widespread popular success for James, despite some criticism that the story was, quote, an outrage on American girlhood. The story continues to be one of James's most popular works along with The Turn of the Screw and The Portrait of a Lady, and critics have generally praised the freshness and vigor of the storytelling at the time. So we're going to talk about some themes in Daisy Miller that you should be looking for as you read. Um, three of the big themes are freedom, especially as pertaining to rules that govern behavior in society, and the tensions between expatriate modesty and American freedom. We're also going to be looking for the theme of social class, which is hugely important to realist writers. Pay attention as you read Daisy Miller to issues of old wealth versus the nouveau riche. 
Also, the social codes of each of these classes, who has knowledge of the codes and who is able to maneuver within those codes. And finally, the issue and theme of responsibility. The, the story seems to ask the question of who should be responsible for informing Daisy that she is out of line and possibly in danger. So Daisy Miller, like many 19th century works, still relies on that kind of idea of Poe's unity of effect. Everything in the story works very, very closely together to achieve a singular aim. So one of those main things is the setting in Daisy Miller. In the opening paragraph of the story, part of which I've reproduced for you here on the slide, it introduces a cosmopolitan character of the setting. This is a European locale that takes on an American flavor. As you read, think about where else the story feels cosmopolitan. Where do we see American and European ideas, characters, and, man and manners coming together? When they do come together, is it a site of conflict or hybridity? So when you see these two spaces, make sure that you kind of pay attention to how they work. Um, there are basically three main settings in Daisy Miller. Vevey, Switzerland, where the story opens is kind of this hybrid location where Americans have overrun a Swiss town. Rome, Italy is kind of an other location. It's somehow more foreign um, and different than the, the Vevey, Switzerland. And then Geneva, we never actually go to Geneva, but the specter of Geneva kind of haunts this entire story. It's where Winterbourne is from, um, and it is seen as kind of quintessentially European. The rules there are different. So a big part of what we're seeing here is a historical reality, which is after the Civil War, you have this growth in wealth um, in America, which leads many Europeans to go to Europe. They want to go and get culture. Now, if you think back to Emerson, you should remember that he really criticized those Americans who need to go take a tour to find culture. He would have said, we need culture here, as we are. But at this time, it was hugely, hugely popular to go back to Europe and to other places abroad. And you can see pictures here from the late 19th century of tourists in places like Egypt, in Greece, and in the Forum in Rome. Um, ocean liners were routinely going back and forth at this time. If you've ever seen the movie Titanic, this is what is happening. You have um, a level of social class that enables people, both the Nova Riche and the wealthy, the kind of old money wealth, to go back and forth and to visit these locations to get culture and to kind of separate themselves from the masses who, who aren't able to do that. So another issue that we see in Daisy Miller is that Daisy is a stylish American girl. And so this illustration by Harry McVicker appeared as a front piece to the 1892 edition of Daisy Miller by Harper and Brothers. As you read, think about how Daisy's sexuality is presented from the outset. Is it dangerous? Is it silly or capricious? What do the terms flirt and coquette mean? Winterborn calls her both. What does it mean to suggest that such women are dangerous and terrible? And what's the serious turn that one's reputation could take by interacting with such women? So in the quote you see on the page here, this is Winterborn, who's trying to figure out Daisy. And this is a big problem throughout the text, is that Winterborn doesn't know what to make of her. Winterborn has been in Europe for so long, he's not really aware of American culture anymore. Daisy, on the other hand, is part of the Nova Riche, who doesn't really understand upper class culture. And so that you have this um, story where these two kind of misunderstandings are happening simultaneously. We see this especially in Daisy's mystifying manters. Um, so a year after his experiences with Daisy, at the end of the story, Winterborn is still thinking about her behaviors as, quote, mystifying. When he returns to Vevey, the place where he and Daisy met, he's flooded with memories and the ways he mistreated her. So really the question becomes, is this a story about Daisy Miller or is this a story about Winterborn and the life lessons that Daisy taught him? Is Daisy the main character? Is she even a character at all or is she simply a plot device used to develop to Winterborn's character as a mature man of the world? Um, in the early 2000s, film critics started to use the term manic pixie dream girl to describe a certain type of feminine character, often created by writers who were male. Um, these over-the-top personalities were designed to move the male main characters towards a new realization about life. 
So is Daisy Miller kind of the manic pixie dream girl of the 19th century? Does James turn the progressive possibilities of the new woman into yet another way to talk about the lives of men? Or when you read Daisy Miller, do you see James creating a more complex character who's able to comment not only on gender roles, but on the national identity and cultural expectations for Americans in the broader world? Other things that you need to pay attention to as you read through Daisy Miller is this idea of 19th century society, especially the split between the upper class and the newly rich. So in the late 19th and early 20th century, New York City's high society was very stratified and very formalized. Mrs. Astor had her list of what was called, quote, the 400. And the 400 were the 400 best families in the city. These were published lists. Washington Square, an area in Manhattan, and the row, which was a row of townhouses right on the square across from the arch, um, were the places to be. But the problem is, is that during this time, if you remember from our earlier lecture about the Gilded Age, industry is booming. So there are plenty of opportunities for people who might have, in the early 19th century, been simply small shopkeepers. They can now become owners of factories, and they can accrue enormous wealth. These people, these newly wealthy, can purchase houses on Washington Square. They can buy their way into these drawing rooms. But part of what James is going to show and part of what formal realism, high realism shows in the late 19th century is that just because you can pay to get into a drawing room doesn't mean you're going to be accepted by old money, by the high society. But it's really important at the time to remember that in this world, society is everything. We see Daisy talking about society. She's talking about parties, but for the old wealth of the city, society meant breeding. Society meant kind of a bloodline. So in the 19th and early 20th centuries, etiquette was taken very seriously by some Americans, especially the old wealth. It was a time when etiquette meant proper behavior, civility, and deportment. Manners and politeness were taken to heart. They really showed who you were as a person, and you could judge people based on them in ways that we do not do today. The rigid rules and lessons were adhered to not just by wealthy society, but by those who also aspired to be true ladies and gentlemen. This was a way of having social mobility to act correctly if you were rich. If you were unsure of a certain behavior, there were books written on etiquette, some books specifically concentrated on New York City. Um, etiquette was defined as everything which refines a habit of people, ennobles it, and hence the importance of furnishing the public to all possible aids of superior manners. So you see here on this slide, this is the row in Washington Square. These were luxurious townhouses where the very, very rich lived. Um, not the monopolist capitalists, they lived in mansions. I'll show you in just a second. But the old wealth of the city lived here across from um, the beautiful square where they had private rear gardens so they could have bits of private nature within the city. This is mere blocks away from the tenements that I showed you in the Gilded Age. Um, the distance between Washington Square and the Lower East Side is a matter of a five minute walk. So these two worlds were really butted up against each other. These are some images of Gilded Age mansions. We saw the Vanderbilt Mansion in the earlier um, lecture about the Gilded Age. This mansion here in this upper left corner is actually three buildings. I could not fit them all on the screen. But all of these mansions were on Madison Avenue and Fifth Avenue in New York City. Most of them did not even last 50 years. They were built after the Civil War into the early 20th century, but by the 1950s, they'd been torn down to build skyscrapers. So these are enormous mansions, um, most of which would take up the majority of a city block. And these would not be um, the owner's only places of residence. Most of the people who own these mansions, like the Vanderbilts, um, J.P. Morgan and his family, all of these kind of monopolist capitalists would have also had equally large homes in the mountains or by the sea. So if you've ever seen Biltmore in North Carolina, that is the summer home of one of these um, mansion owners. Here's an example of an etiquette book. Um, you can see there are many, many rules, everything about like how you take your hat off, how you walk with a woman, how you don't walk with a woman, how you interact with people. 
um, what defines a lady and what defines a gentleman. So everything at this time, especially within society, is about recognition and appearance. You have to wear the right clothes. You have to know your table manners and your tableware. You have to keep things chivalrous. So there was this idea of you know, being chivalrous as a knight of old. So when you see Winterborn at the beginning of Daisy Miller, pay attention to how he actually treats her. Is he being chivalrous or is he being kind of a cad or a scamp? You're also not supposed to draw attention to yourself in any way. Everything about etiquette is about kind of silence and quiet, right? That you move through the world in a way that doesn't draw ostentatious um, attention to yourself. And above all, especially for women, you had to protect the appearance of innocence, even if you weren't innocent. Which brings me to a really important point that we need to look at in Daisy Miller, and that's the idea of perception versus reality. Identity in this world is performative. It is read by the crowd. Your identity is based on how you behave in these rooms and whether you know the rules and how to enact the rules in the correct way. It is also performative in Daisy Miller. We see this again and again, that she is judged and read by the crowd through the things she says and does. But it's really important as you read through this story that you pay attention to the fact that Daisy is only known to us, the reader, through Winterborn and his reactions to her behavior. But if you take a look at the very opening of Daisy Miller, what you should notice is Winterborn is not our narrator. Our narrator is a first person narrator who is guessing at Winterborn. Right? It's not even an omniscient narrator. So we are not in the omniscient narrators of um, the birthmark or fall of House of Usher, where the narrator kind of tells us everything from the very beginning. Instead, this narrator is still guessing at what Winterborn is thinking. So the only thing that we know about Daisy Miller is through a narrator who's interpreting what somebody else might think about Daisy Miller. This kind of like you know, interpretation and reading from three steps back is really important because it really links to James's idea about how realism works. He said the power to guess the unseen from the seen, to trace the implications of things, to judge the whole piece by the pattern is really the key to realism. He's interested in the psychology of people and how what we see is only the kind of surface of the psychology that lies beneath. So as you read through Daisy Miller, see if you can find places where you are judging Daisy or you are understanding Daisy based on what Winterborn thinks. And when you start doing that, recognize that Winterborn himself doesn't know how to read the situation anymore. Um, his aunt says, you have been abroad too long. You're going to get yourself in trouble, right? He doesn't know how to read American manners anymore. He doesn't know how to read a young American girl anymore. And yet he is really the only way we have to interpret Daisy's innocence. So I hope you enjoyed Daisy Miller. Um, it is not a very long read. It's a novella, but it's a complete kind of story. Um, pay attention to those themes that we talked about, um, especially issues of freedom, where freedom exists and where tension exists, social class, pay attention to old wealth versus new wealth and how those social codes are used to keep people kind of in boxes. And then as you read, think about like who ultimately is responsible for Daisy? Is she responsible for herself? Um, is her mother responsible? Is Winterborn, who knows better, responsible? Or is it some combination of these? So I hope you enjoyed the story. Please let me know if you have any questions. I'm happy to talk more about it with you.